So if you wanted to know about a world without X, then one way you may do that is take a step backwards and look at what the world looked like before X existed, before X ever happened. And you could compare what it looked like then and then ask yourself what X meant to that specific individual or that world as a result of happening now. And that story exists in this picture. It's a story that I think better than most captures the significance of, in this case, endurance in the life and the existence of one person. And that person is shown here, carrying the flag for the USA at the Olympic opening ceremony in 2008 in Beijing. His name is Lopez Le Mans. He was born in Sudan, but he has fled the civil war in his country and emigrated to the USA at the age of 16. There he would finish school, he would go to college, and he would go on to become one of his nations and the world's best middle and long distance runners, hence his presence in this picture. But that's not the story. The story is that when he was six years old, he was kidnapped by soldiers of the Sudanese People's Liberation Army to become a child soldier. He'd gone with his family and 50 village members down to the local church when it was stormed by soldiers carrying AK-47s. They separated the adults from the children they threw the children into a truck and drove them a few hours to a holding camp where any boy who was old enough and big enough would be trained to fire the gun and become a soldier in that country's civil war. Lopez Le Mans was not one of them. He was too small. He was barely as tall as an AK-47 is long. And so his fate instead was to be locked in a hut which would serve as a prison and where for the next three weeks he would eat a single meal every day consisting of sorghum that had been mixed with water and sand and he would watch as half of his village members and friends go to sleep one night and never wake up the next morning. But Lopez Lamont was not one of those boys either. He might have been too weak to kill, but he was too strong to die early. But the same fate arguably awaited him. But then one night, three weeks later, three boys, older boys from his village, who had been trained as soldiers, grabbed him by the arms and said, stay with us, we're getting out of here. And they spotted a hole in the fence and hatched an escape plan. And they waited for a particularly dark African night. They crawled past drunk soldiers at a campfire. They went through the hole in the fence. And they started to do something that is uniquely human. They ran. They were literally running for their lives. As though someone were chasing them. And they did this for three days and three nights. Despite leaving in a state of starvation. Despite not having access to much food or water. And not knowing whether they were leaving something behind that might have been safer than the hell that awaited them. They didn't know where they were going. But they ran and ran and ran. And eventually they ran all the way to the Kenyan border. And there they were picked up by a policeman who took them to a refugee camp. The mom was moved to another camp and it was there that he would spend the next 10 years of his life. Going to school, playing football and continuing to run. Eventually at the age of 16, he would receive an offer to apply for a US driven visa program, he wrote a letter explaining his life story, it was successful, he found himself on a plane to New York to begin a new life, a life that would culminate as a runner in the USA, driven by this purpose. I came all the way here, so I have to keep running. And it was that running that would take him to Beijing 2008, where he would become the honor, receive the honor of being a flag bearer for that country, his new country. Now I could stand here and spill the next 15 minutes of this presentation with five or six other stories about what running means to a specific individual. But there's an even bigger question here. It's about what running and endurance and our ability to endure through running means for every single person, for the human race in fact. And so that's the question is what would the world, the collective world be without endurance and where would we, again the collective be, be without running? And those are the questions that are worth tackling. So it's just as well we frame this question as one of endurance because it turns out that if it was a question of speed, humans are hopelessly outmatched by other animals. Hopelessly, especially predators. So for instance, the cheetah, the fastest land animal, has been clocked at 120 k an hour, which means that you could give Usain Bolt a 65 meter head start and the cheetah would still be even a 100. The lion, not as fast as 80, but quick enough to make up a deficit of 40 meters. And then there's the hyena which is not exactly known for its athleticism, but it's been clocked at 60 k an hour, 
And then there's Usain Bolt, who is known for his athleticism and has been clocked at a measly 44.7 k's an hour, which is the fastest speed ever by a human, and most of us would be lucky to get half as fast as this. And so if it came down to speed, humans would be extinct. Simple story. And in fact, even, I'm told, I'm not sure I believe this stat, but I'm told that hippos have been popped at 50. <laughs> I don't know who measured this. It was probably the last thing he ever did with the radar gun. <laughs> but we honor his contribution to science for this picture. And we said that this iconic picture of Usain Bolt in Beijing 2008, looking across, celebrating as he was about to win gold, had this been the Animal Olympics, this picture would have looked a bit different, right? <laughs> we are. We are in a speed race, hopelessly outmatched. We'd be extinct. So it's just as well. But instead, what we have is endurance. In a paper about 10 years ago, published by two scientists in Nature, not a novel concept, there's a famous uh, author called Bernd Heinrich who wrote a book called Why We Run, the same concept, is that endurance running was a significant component of our evolution. It's a capability that is almost unique to humans. In fact, among primates, it certainly is. And it was instrumental in the evolution of the human body. And so there are three reasons that we are built for endurance <coughs> under two categories. The first of those is mechanical. We are quite literally mechanically designed for distance. The second is physiological, which consists of two parts. The one is that we are thermal warriors. We are better than any other animal at dealing with heat that we generate as a result of exercise. And the second is that we are unique in our ability to pace ourselves and manage how we spend energy and effort <coughs> during exercise. So let's talk about these three. The first one is the design. So Steve Jobs has said that design is not about how something looks, it's about how it works. So I'll tell you how it works for running. And for this we need a model. And this is our model. His name is Asbol Kiprock, former Olympic champion, world champion over 1500 and male skinny jean model. And he, is, <laughs> he is the extreme of what a runner should look like. If you were to design a runner from scratch with a blueprint, this is pretty much what you'd end up with. And there are three reasons for this. The first of those is these exceptionally long tendons, particularly the Achilles tendon that you can see, and very short muscles. So this is important because other primates have it the other way around. They've got very long muscles with short tendons. And the tendons are crucial to running because when we run, they function like springs. Every time we land, they stretch, and then they recoil on takeoff. And what that does is it reduces the cost of running significantly, about 50% lower as a consequence of having particularly two, the Achilles that I showed you earlier, and the other one's the, the tendon in the plantar arch of the foot. Enormous energy save. So that's the first one. The second one is these incredibly long legs relative to our height. Now this is something all humans have. These are particularly long. But it's important to have long legs, not only for the obvious reason of stride, but particularly they have to be long and skinny. And again, if we make a comparison with primates, they tend to have very short legs relative to their body. Humans are what we call linear. That's important because any mass that is distal, by distal we mean near the ends, so anything below the knee, increases the cost enormously. If you want to slow someone down, you put a kilogram on their shoes, not their waist. It makes a massive difference at the ends, not so much in the middle. So that's really important. Humans have this characteristic. So there are two deviations we can make here to illustrate the point. The first is on this body proportion size. On your left is the world's greatest ever swimmer, Michael Phelps, who stands 193 meters tall. On your right is one of the world's greatest ever runners. His name is Fisher and he stands 175 meters tall. And you can see he's kissing his legs in a way he might, because what you don't know is that these two men wear the same length pants. And so what you're looking at on the left is a very long body and short legs. And on the right, you're looking at extremely long legs and short body. And so this is built to run, and this is built to swim. And humans are this extreme. Not that I'm saying Phelps is my human. <laughs> Primates would be on the left of Phelps. So there's obviously a spectrum. <laughs> but, but the point is that having long legs is a beneficial trait for runners. And that's exactly what humans have compared to any other primates. The second point, this is related to this issue of length and mass and tendons, came from London last year, where our Oscar Pistorius, shown here on the left, complained when he was beaten by a Brazilian sprinter called Alan Oliveira. And the media was crazy, and there were allegations that this guy had artificially increased his legs, and they reviewed the video evidence afterwards. And what they... <laughs> 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 
the, the, debate, the debate got stuck on this length issue. There were actually three things. Length is one of them. But that's not decisive in this debate. It may have been in this particular one. But the real issue, as I've mentioned to you, is the mass. Because these carbon fiber limbs weigh next to nothing, much less than a human limb below the knee. And the result of that is when they test these guys, they discover that they can move their legs so quickly through the air, they can reposition their limbs so fast, that it removes an athletic limit to performance. And so any double amputee sprinter, okay, regardless of length, has an advantage over able-bodied sprinters because they can spend more time on the ground because they can make it up in the air. That means they can run the same speeds with less athleticism. And the other thing that happens is these carbon fiber blades are much more effective than our tendons at giving back that energy. So I told you the difference between humans and primates with the long tendons. This is a next level up. So these tendons only lose about 8 to 10 percent of their energy. Human tendons lose about 50. So that's an enormous advantage. And this is the reason that in our lifetime, this will one day happen. And the greyhounds will one day be beaten by the technology. And so, so that's a, an illustration of how the length and the mass and the body shape issue is in play for, for running. But the, the, that's the technology applied to the concept. Back to our model. The final thing that is important is that we are unique and that we have the ability to rotate segments of our body independently. So we can rotate around the pelvis and our heads. And that's important because it allows us to stabilize the trunk and pelvis. Because if we couldn't do that, then every time we ran, we would land and pitch forward and backwards and we'd look like a rocking horse when we ran. But we don't because we've got a gluteus maximus that's large, we've got erector spinae muscles in the back, and so they keep the trunk upright. And then the other thing is as soon as we swing our right leg forward, our left arm can come forward and that keeps our body from rotating around like a helicopter that's lost its tail there. And so we are able to then run and throw which made a big difference to hunting. So those three things are part of the design and why we have this advantage over other primates in particular. So the question is, how did we put this design to use? And the answer is that we developed a method of hunting that became known as persistent hunting. And there's no secret to this, it's a pretty straightforward concept. You find an animal in the hottest part of the day and you chase it and you run and you run and you run. Because what the animal can't do that you can is cool down. And there have been many studies done on animals and on humans, and what they find is that there exists a limit for body temperature beyond which animals cannot continue to exercise. So for example, in cheetahs, back when sports scientists were real men, they used to test cheetahs in the biofield, real cheetahs, and they used to make them run on treadmills. And eventually the cheetah would overheat. And when its body temperature is somewhere around 40.5, 41, it just simply lies down with its feet in the air and can't run anymore. Same thing happens in rats and beagles in goats, in antelope, in mice, and it turns out in humans. But humans are very effective at not getting to that limit for a couple of reasons. The main one, which is our, is our ability to sweat. And we can lose enormous amounts of heat as a consequence of the evaporation of sweat. There are a couple of others, the loss of body hair in most people, <laughs> our linearity again, because it means more surface area to lose the heat, like a radiator that adds heat, same concept. But it's this one, our ability to sweat, that allows us to keep our body temperature shown here underneath that thermal limit for five, six hours despite the heat. So this is an example of an Argus cycle to a cyclist. And you can see he starts off and very quickly gets to almost 39. And then he just stays there because we're so good at regulating body temperature. And so that's a very important uh, aspect of the, of the physiology that allowed us to then hunt and take advantage of that design. Now, what happens at 40 degrees Celsius? This is an interesting question. So scientists are able to measure how much muscle is being activated. Because every time I contract the muscle, it requires that my brain sends a signal to the muscle, and that's electricity. And so we can pick that signal up. And so scientists have done this, and they do it, and they measure the EMG, that's what this is, electrical signal. And they do it over a two minute contraction in guys who are exercised in the heat, and they are overheated, 40 degrees Celsius. And then they do it in guys at 38. And this is what you find, is that as soon as our brain has heated up to 40 degrees Celsius, it quite literally is less capable of activating muscle. In other words, the hot brain can't activate the muscle. You've probably seen thousands of runners, and you very rarely see that happen. And the question now is, why not? If it was so easy to overheat, you'd see it all the time. But it doesn't happen. So why is it so rare, and what really happens? So we did this study also five or six years back, it was published more than that, where we looked at the power output during cycling 
and we measured it in hot and cold conditions, and this is what we find. Now, nothing unusual about that shape, but there are two moments that you need to understand. The first of those is decision A, which happens here. You can see that for the first part, they start off the same. Hot or cold doesn't matter. They go, they go the same speed in the beginning. And then something happens that causes them to slow down in the heat, but not the cold. Now, based on what I've just told you, you're thinking maybe they've overheated, and so their hot brain can't activate the muscle anymore. So we need to ask that question. But then the second decision, decision B, happens at the end, where with the finish line in sight, they speed up in both conditions. So you need to ask, well, how is it possible to speed up? What's changed? So we look into this, we go to decision A, and we discover that their body temperature is only 38.3 and 38.4, so they're not actually hot. So why did they slow down? Because this wasn't explainable, according to what I've just shown you. And then we jump ahead to decision B, which is at the end of exercise, and you discover that now they're actually hotter than before, now they're speeding up, so it's completely upside down. So why does this happen? And so we measured the same thing I showed you previously, this electrical activity in the muscle, and we find that throughout the exercise in the heat, you activate less muscle. So in the cold, you can actually activate more muscle than the heat. And that's because our brains are clever enough, we're clever enough, to understand that if we didn't do this, we would overheat. And so slowing down and underperforming in hot conditions doesn't happen because of overheating. It happens so that you don't. So it's completely the other way around. And this is called pacing strategy. And so it's almost like we have this ability to predict the physiological future. And we, we call this anticipatory regulation of pacing strategy. And it's the third element of our ability to hunt other animals. Because they can't do this. They just sprint, and then when they think they're safe, they stop. We don't. We just keep going, and keep going, and keep going. And eventually we drive them hotter and hotter and hotter. They get to the same situation as in the video, and we get to eat meat and protein. And it was that meat and protein that was really pivotal to our development because it allowed our brains to develop. And that allowed us to build buildings and take all these things happen as a consequence of our ability to hunt, which was a consequence of our ability to run and endurance. So fatigue is not failure but the avoidance, and it happens not because we'd rather so that. So where does this leave us today? Because the world is a different place. We don't sleep on rocks, we sleep on silly posturepedics. We don't sit and climb trees, we sit at ergonomically designed chairs that squeak in return. We don't hunt our food on the savannas, we hunt it at Woolworths. So life is different now. But, but, the reality is that whether you are tall or short, whether you are male or female, whether you're African, Asian, American, European, South American, Australian, whether you run for fitness or health or weight loss, whether you're running towards something or away from something else, the point is that you can. We can run, and running and endurance is something that is uniquely human. I run, therefore I am. Because without running, the world may not even have existed.